Hello all, welcome back to 5WH, my name is Joe. Today we're going to be having a look at the recent coup in Gabon. A uh, bit of a uh, disclaimer up front, this is still very much breaking news, so some of these facts are unclear, a little amorphous, things will change. It's likely we'll be doing some updates on this in the relatively near future. So once we've finished looking at the presidential guard dancing with their new presidential candidate, we shall move on. Right, so what's going on? Well, short answer is that there's been a coup in Gabon, which is a West African country, and we'll cover the geography in a second. Um, and this is interesting because it is the eighth coup in French-speaking Africa, or Francophone Africa, if you will, in the last two years. Now, in the larger picture of what happened, there was scheduled to be Gabon's first ever general election, um, not first ever election, but general in the sense that both the presidential uh, election and the uh, parliamentary election were happening concurrently on the same ballot sheet. When this election took place, the incumbent president announced he was running. He was then announced the victor with 64% of the vote out of a field of approximately 18 challenges. Um, so clearly a pretty large majority he's alleging there. Uh, although there were, as I said, 18 challenges, so 19 candidates in total, six of those opposition candidates formed uh, an alternative uh, platform to try and bolster their vote numbers and provide a significant challenge to uh, Mr. Bongo there, the president. However, so then what happened after that? Well, we had the internet shut off, allegedly for security due to uh, threats made by opposition leaders. Borders were closed. Gunfire was reported in the capital, and the president was then arrested by presidential guards. Um, and demonstrations happened in the streets, allegedly in support of the uh, of the revolution. So, as you can see here, we have a lovely uh, pictorial history of how elections should go. We have a uh, damaged and shot up sign of the president uh, Ali Bongo running for presidency. That's uh, Ali for you in French. The uh, slogan there. There's a picture of him in his. Uh, in his prime, giving a speech. Uh, and then we have some cl video clips of, you know, how it was, how it's going. We've got your stereotypical men in a sort of camouflage around an improvised lectern, giving a speech that they now control the country. Uh, again, mostly presidential guards are separate from the army. We'll cover that a little later. Um, Gabonese citizens approaching the military in the street to celebrate their removal of the president from power. And then in the bottom, we have members of the newly selected uh, political leader, you know, cheering him and carrying through the streets. So let's put this in some geographical context. So where are we talking? So you can probably see uh, just below the center of the map is Gabon. It's a country in West Africa, slightly below the sort of Sahel belt that, you know, other news has been covering recently. And we can see coming around from, clockwise from the top, it's got Equatorial Guinea to the immediate north, Cameroon, Central African... Oh, sorry. Coming around from the top, in a clockwise manner, we can see it borders Equatorial Guinea, Cameroon, the Republic of the Congo. In terms of sort of wider framing within Africa, you can see Nigeria's in the top corner there, which is uh, of relevance primarily because it's one of the larger uh, and more sort of economically and militarily powerful African nations. So it, its uh, position in context is quite relevant. And then again, for just framing, you can see the Democratic Republic of the Congo down in the southeastern corner there, taking up a good chunk of the map. In terms of other places of reference, you can see that Libreville uh, is the capital of Gabon, and that is on the, the northern edge of the coast. You can see that just below Equatorial Guinea. Other key uh, key cities are Port Gentil, which is a key for import and export out of the country. So a bit of uh, other geographical information for Gabon, it uh, is approximate, in terms of like square mileage, it's about the same size as the UK, but it has a population of roughly 2.3 to 2.5 million people, which is approximately a quarter of London. So we're talking quite a large area with a pretty sparse population, and those that population is pretty densely packed into the urban areas. In terms of the sort of wider sort of economic element of the geography, we then look at Gabon as a major oil exporter. So it exports enough oil that it has membership of OPEC, the oil cartel. Uh, and this gives it 
by you know regional standards a pretty high GDP, although GDP is a little bit of a dishonest measure here as it's obviously an average across the entire population. And the distribution of that wealth is by no means equal. There is a distinct ruling clique who are benefiting from the extraction of Gabon's significant natural resources. And you've got most of the rest of the people. That's not to say they're not doing pretty well. Again, you know, its neighbours in Africa are sadly, in often cases, pretty destitute states. And Gabon is arguably doing better than many of them. But this shouldn't be seen as somewhere that um, is not challenged by that wealth disparity we see in a lot of African countries. So let's get some of those key actors out of the way, shall we? So who? So uh, bottom right here is President Ali Bongo. So he was, until yesterday, the president of Gabon, and he took over the presidency in 2009, uh, taking over from his father Omar Bongo, who took power in a, uh, well, sort of a coup in 1967. He ha uh, Ali has what won, big air quotes here, three elections, nominally including the one most recently. Um, However, every single one of these elections has been significantly marred by allegations of fraud or voter interference. To say that these elections are not free and fair would be probably an understatement. Uh, so he stands in for the uh, Gabonese Democratic Party, GDP or GPD, it's, it's French, so their acronyms often get switched around because of the different, uh, different word order in French sentences. Um, and in terms of weaknesses, I mean, he's not a young man. He's got pretty poor health. He's pre he has a history of a number of medical conditions, including a stroke most recently that put him out of action for about 10 months between 2018 and 2019. And this previous period of absence actually culminated in an attempted coup in 2019. Obviously, attempted coup was put down, but there, there remain significant questions about his health and competence. And, I mean... You know, it's very easy to cast aspersions of, uh, on someone's health and competence, but given his public health records, you know, they're not. There's no smoke without fire in this case, um, and this is also a contributing factor to him being seen as having, shall we say, a less than productive most recent term, and a lot of political pressure is being applied or has been applied within Gabon to replace him with someone, uh, shall we say, healthier and more vigorous. Um, so immediately above him, we have the uh, Bryce Oligui, who is currently the acting leader of the transitional government. He is a general in the Gabon uh, Presidential Republican Guard, with his rather snazzy red uniform on there. So we don't really know much about him yet. Um, he was educated in Gabon. He went to the uh, military academy in Gabon. He is a not too distant cousin of President Ali Bongo. So we're not looking at this is not a step change. He is, although he's now head of the transitional government, this is not necessarily going to be a replacement of one ruling family with another. This could very well be a just handing over of the keys in a, a slightly, you know, dressed up in camouflage sort of sense. Uh, but we'll discover more about him later. Um, a key thing, though, that he has been uh, pronouncing on, even in the first 24 hours of his his rule, uh, is the idea of him standing on an anti-corruption mandate to separate himself from former President Bongo. The, the issue with this, however, is that he's known to hold several properties in the United States worth over a million quid. He's been investigated for corruption himself by international agencies. So... Although there's no doubt at all that the Bongo family uh, corruptly exploited Gabon's natural resources to benefit themselves, this anti-corruption spin being put on by the opposition is likely a facade. I, I don't see uh, any indication that Oligui is going to be any less corrupt as a ruler than Ali Bongo. So uh, in the top left there we've got Albert Osser. The key relevance of Albert Osser is he was the unity candidate that I mentioned earlier, that six of the 18 candidates stepped down to put him as the main opposition candidate to Mr. Bongo in the most recent election. Um, I have not heard anything about him 
since the coup kicked off. So he's of relevance to us going forward in the seeing, does he get arrested? Where does he place his weight? Is going to be a, an indicator and warning for where this coup is going. Uh, and then bottom left, we have a picture of the president, of the, the ex-president of the Gabon Senate, which is the higher house of the legislature. I've not managed to find the man's name out yet, unfortunately, but he was uh, apparently arrested trying to leave Gabon this morning with a suitcase full of cash. And I just thought it was a just a very on-brand image to put on here for you, just to give you a bit of um, a bit of colouring for what's going on here. Um, aside from that, we also need to consider some sort of geopolitical who's. Um, Gabon is obviously an African state. It is a member of ECOWAS. It is a member of the African Union. Both of these multinational organisations have previously expressed condemnation of other coups in the region and have expressed concern, strongly phrased concern, about the coup ongoing in Gabon. However, Gabon as an economy is very separate to a lot of the other African, uh, the ECOWAS states, so we shouldn't necessarily view this as part of that pattern. And also it's slight geographical separation from the remaining ECOWAS states means that it may not be so likely to see intervention on that level. Um, we also kind of need to consider France, but I really think they're out of it for this, so I'll, I'll discuss them later in passing, but just be aware that Gabon was a French state. President Macron of France has visited relatively recently. There's a lot of popular anger against France, although I'm not entirely sure all of that anger is well-placed, and that may come up again in future. So... Let's rattle on to our when. So, as it says at the top there, this timeline is very much in flux. Reporting is still coming out. The internet's been turned on, turned off, back on again. All sorts of stuff's going on. And we're less than 48 hours into a coup d'etat. So, you know, just this is, this is more like guidelines anyway. So, without further ado, 9th of July, President Ali Bongo announces his intention to run in the first... Gabonese general election. On the 24th of July, six of the 18 opposition candidates unify around the Alternance, I can't speak French, 23 platform, and the election is then conducted on the 26th of August, so uh, four day, five days ago. On the 29th of August, you know, votes been counting, votes been counting, all good, all fine. 29th of August, government cuts the internet. A, uh, a minister, the Minister for Environment, Ecology and Rainforest, who's actually a British citizen, he was a pro-environmental activist who was appointed, his Twitter indicates that the internet was cut due to threats made by the opposition. I mean, a coup's now happened, so who knows, it could well be genuine, but it's very rarely a good sign that a ruling party cuts internet connectivity during an election. Um, and then the results of the election were announced in the middle of the night between the 29th and 30th of August. So on the 30th of August, we then see, and this is throughout the day, so I've just put it at the start, we hear reports of sporadic gunfire throughout Libreville, primarily earlier in the morning. And then at 0535 local, which also is British summertime, um, we get an announcement from the military of them seizing power. And that's the picture I had earlier on of the uh, several guys in assorted camouflage standing around a Ikea-esque looking podium. Immediately following that, about yeah, two and a half hours later, internet is restored, which again, is probably a good sign. It's a sign of the um, the coup leader's confidence if, having immediately conducted a coup, they give the public access to communication again. Um, whether, that's not us saying they're, whether they're good or bad, but it definitely indicates they believe they have popular support. Um, and then later in the day, about 1,400 hours local, we see uh, a video of President Bongo in what looks to be his residence, releasing a video requesting popular support and protests in the streets. This video was confirmed as genuine by a PR company working for the president. However, no protests really happened. Um, throughout this period, we're seeing people on the streets greeting soldiers, etc., etc. Small gatherings of a couple of hundred to a thousand people. We're not talking mass demonstrations, but what does seem to be the case, at least at the moment, is that all of these protests, or all these demonstrations, sorry, are pro-coup. There don't appear to be any uh, grassroots protests rising up in support of the ousted president. And then roughly 
1730, 1731, we get the first message coming out from the transitional uh, committee suggesting that Olegui was going to be their, their leader for the transitional phase. It's worth noting that immediately after this, Olegui said he was not going to be the leader of the transitional government. So he his de facto, whether he is de jure, is a separate issue. And I'm sure we'll see this develop as it goes along. And then just for a bit of flavour, because again, as I said earlier, I thought it was quite funny. At about 11 o'clock this morning, uh, 31st of August, the ex-Senate president was arrested leaving the country with a, a literal suitcase full of cash. I'll put the link to that video um, in the comments. It's just faintly amusing, really. I've never seen that much cash in one place. It's some proper, like, cartel-level shit. Um, it's also worth noting, actually, while we're at it, that when the president's property was raided, there's, there's as inevitably, uh, phone footage of people going through his property. And again, there are literal piles of cash hanging around. Um, not that I want to cast too many aspersions, but we're talking, like, Pablo Escobar levels of just literal physical hard currency it's quite impressive if you're a if you're that way inclined and then so we're going to come to the why and how and this is we'll have to see how it goes we're still very much in progress but there's a few key questions and the biggest one that everyone is or at least the media is screeching about is whether this recent coup in gabon is part of the pattern of coups or alleged pattern of coups we've seen spreading through a uh, sort of central and western africa since uh, about two years ago, we had, um, well, yeah, the coups we've seen in West Africa. So, there are a few things where I'd like to tease it out from some of the others. So, what we have here is a situation where an ossified dynastic family controls the presidency and has a very tight grip on the politics of the country. Now, the reason this is important is that, for two reasons. Firstly, it is separate to the recent coup in Niger, where the president who was ousted was democratically elected, and the military coup was a very definite military uh, kick to the governing authorities. Whereas in this case, there is a lens through which you could see it as a shift that the military could transition this towards democracy, because fundamentally, although... Um, although President Bongo allegedly won 64% of the vote. The election and previous elections have been heavily riven by allegations of voter fraud. International observers either aren't permitted to have access or, or raise red flags left, right and centre. So in that sense, this is a distinctly different flavour, perhaps to Niger. Um, and we also then have to think about a few other things. So a lot of people are looking into... You know, is is there a mysterious puppet master behind the coup? Or whose fault is it, or whatever? And pretty much every media source I've looked at so far has been pretty keen to place the blame on the French. However, I think there's a few things to look at here. So yes, France is the former colonial power in Gabon. It's the former colonial power in most of the places there have been coups in Africa in the last couple of years. But ultimately. Although they, they had cordial relations with the Bongo regime, the military garrison in, in the country was very small. It was actually a training mission for the Gabonese forces, not a you know, it wasn't a forward footprint base in the you know, in the sense of some of their other camps they've got out there. Um and also although France was the largest uh provider of imports to Gabon, the largest export partner that Gabon has is actually China. Uh, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative and similar. So when we're looking at, you know, potentially, you know, puppet masters behind everything, whereas France is possibly correctly getting a lot of flack. I mean, imperial legacy is, is difficult for any Western nation. And this is not by any means trying to defend France. Uh, some of the things they got up to are pretty awful. But that is, that's looking with a retrospective lens. France is a very useful scapegoat. But in terms of their actual real economic power in Gabon at the moment, they are dwarfed, absolutely dwarfed by the influence of Chinese exporters. So, and then I've put Russia in there as well. And that's because in some of the other um, 
coups we've seen or Central African Republic as well is basically run or was run by Wagner Group, although I'm not sure what's going on since Wagner's disintegrated. Um, basically, there has been a, a narrative that Russia has been, you know, weaving its web through Africa. Uh, people, you know, tankies on Twitter, very keen to say that Putin's playing 5D chess with the West. But I, I really don't see a case for that here. Um, again, that's a quite a distinction between some of the coups elsewhere in Africa, in that, as yet, there doesn't appear to be an overt, non-native hand in what's going on. Again, we're very early, that may change. Um, so hopefully that's given you a bit of a grasp of the why and the how at the moment. Um, again, and anticipating this may need an update in a bit as we see how this transitions. I think it's time for us to wrap towards the conclusion. So, things to key points to take away. The transitional leader Olegui is a member of the ruling family, is a close relative, a cousin of some description, to former President Bongo. And because of this, we are not seeing a fundamental change in the ruling class. Uh, you could liken it, uh, perhaps to those of you who like your ancient history or medieval history, to some of the politics of Byzantium, where you see different family members, they're using the army as their political tool, but ultimately it's it's all just changes in the same ruling class. That's probably a reasonable an analogy for this, at least at, at first view. And because of this, it is fundamentally of different nature to the other coups. Like, well, firstly, the coup could realistically transition us towards democracy rather than away from it. We have a fraudulent election followed by a coup, on the same day as the results being announced. So we, we you know, we see that that transition that way. As opposed to, again, most obviously Niger, which was a very clear steer away from democracy. And then on the international level, I think it's an image problem for France, because if you search any article looking at the Gabon coup, France will get slated in there somewhere. But fundamentally at this point, I think they're being a scapegoat rather than the cause. And I, I think we're going to... I can't say there is an international party pushing for this coup or that's caused it or is whatever, but I'm pretty adamant it's not France. And I think if we're looking at economic causes, we might want to look more in the direction of China. Um, but anyway, so that's that. I would obviously love to hear what you think. Um, I am obviously not on the ground in Gabon. If anyone is on the ground in Gabon, I would love to hear your comments. Um, if you've liked this video, the insight, I would very much like you to... Uh, Join me, subscribe on uh, on YouTube, like like the video. Again, you can find us on fi uh, as 5WH Pod on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, uh, yeah, I'd really love to hear what you think, and I look forward to speaking to you soon. Cheers all, bye.